What it's really about is whether can a group of agents who um, decide that they're going to describe some of the other agents in terms of quantum mechanics consistently reason using quantum mechanics about, uh, about what's going to happen in an experiment. Um, so there's now been a few, the literature on this has got a bit more complicated over the past couple of years. Um, I'd say there's kind of three versions of this result. There's the one in the original uh, Frau Schaigerena paper, which uh, Lydia briefly um, explained. Uh, there's also a version which, is, which has a sort of complicated history, which is really due to Matt Pusey, and I spoke, up, I spoke about it two years ago in Banff. So everything you need to know about that theorem, uh, you can just uh, remember what happened two years ago or watch the video. Um, and then there's a version called uh, by Cheslav Bruckner. Um, and all of these are based on some kind of mashup of Bell's theorem uh, and, and the Wigner's friend experiment. The point of which is to basically turn what are counterfactual alternatives in Bell's theorem into actual alternatives. So you use the Wigner's friend setup to enable uh, Wigner to erase one of the measurements and then uh, the other agent can then make this second measurement. So, uh, you know, in a sort of typical Bell CH SH setup, now all of the measurements are actually being made, um, and you derive some conclusion from that. Now, uh, my conclusion, which I talked about uh, a couple of years ago again, is that basically these, these results have pretty much no impact on uh, many of them sort of mainstream realist interpretations. So if you adopt an interpretation which has a global picture of the entire universe, a wave function of the universe which is evolving unitarily and you know perhaps nothing else as in Everett or perhaps extra, extra degrees of freedom as in Bohm, then there's really no problem with this. You just take the global picture um, as it is and uh, sure, some strange things happen in the experiment, but strange things happen in quantum mechanics, uh, and this is perhaps no stranger than anything else. Where I think the, the results really have teeth is if you want to take some kind of Copenhagenish type of view, um, and how I characterize those views is perhaps uh, trying to have your cake and eat it too, right? So the idea is, in these points of view that, um, we want to be skeptical that the quantum formalism describes the literal state of affairs of the world. We want to take it as more a representation of knowledge, but at the same time, we want to regard it as the fundamental theory. Um, and in these kind of interpretations, the conclusion I draw from these results is that they have to be perspectival, which means that um, there isn't uh, a reality, there isn't sort of just one reality. Uh, reality depends on where you're sitting. So each agent in principle has their own reality. Um, and it happens that in normal circumstances these usually tend to agree with each other, but if we do certain types of experiments, very difficult to do experiments, then we would see the effect that these things are, are, are really distinct. Um, so that's kind of a shocking conclusion. I, I mean, to, to conclude, I want to say that uh, to my mind, what's really great about these theorems is that they say anything about Copenhagen-style interpretations at all, because uh, usually when we talk about no-go theorems, we start by saying, okay, assume there's some state of reality, uh, and then the reasoning is all about counterfactual uh, possibilities, which Copenhagen advocates can just sort of dismiss as saying, well, I don't believe in any of that. So here we have perhaps the first example of a, a set of results which actually tells you something meaningful about what those interpretations have to be like. And what it tells you is that they're far stranger than probably most physicists who say they advocate in Copenhagen interpretation. And I would argue that you know, despite what we might hear at foundational conferences like this, if you go into your average physics department, you'll still find most physicists saying they advocate some kind of Copenhagen interpretation. And they think that they're being very hard-headed empiricists uh, when they do that. They think that, you know, they're believing that things like detector clicks really have objective existence and the whole thing is built on top of that. 
But this kind of results is telling you that if you want to be consistent, it has to be much stranger than that. There have to be, in some sense, many worlds, not many parallel universes like in uh, Everett, but one world for each agent who exists in, in the universe. Yeah. So, uh, okay, for the question as stated, uh, you know, can quantum theory consistently describe uh, its own use? Like, my first reaction is to say, well, sure, you know, quantum mechanics can clearly describe a universe that contains agents who apply quantum mechanics and who mostly get excellent results from it. Uh, you know, uh, you know the many worlds interpretation, regardless of whether you uh, believe it or not, is sort of one model for 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 how that can happen. But there are uh, a couple of important provisos to that statement. Uh, you know, a famous example is uh, you know if you uh, believe the many worlds interpretation, right? Then it 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 predicts that there will be some observers who. Uh, uh, um, try to apply quantum mechanics and get complete nonsense results, right? They take uh, uh, qubits that are in the state zero plus one over root two, and they measure them over and over in the zero one basis. And instead of seeing random results, they just see uh, uh, an encoding of Seth Lloyd's entanglement song or, you know, what, or, or whatever, right? Or they see all zeros. Okay, but... Uh, um, uh, so you know, so it doesn't describe the experiences of the, of that tiny fraction of observers, you could say. But now, um, um, you know, a second proviso is that if you yourself are being manipulated in a coherent superposition state, then you cannot unproblematically apply the Born rule. You know, as if you weren't being manipulated that way. Uh, and, you know, I think that's really at the core of this uh, uh, Frauchiger and Renner setup, right? But there are even uh, simpler examples where that happens. Uh, I mean, uh, one issue is that the Born rule tells us, you know, the probability of an outcome, you know, when a measurement is made, but it does not tell us sort of uh, uh, transition probabilities or sort of multiple time, you know, probabilities for multiple time correlations. So for example, you know, let B be a state of your brain where you're uh, uh, seeing a blue dot and let R be a state of your brain where you're seeing a red dot. Right now, imagine that you're in a state like uh, square root of one third B plus square root of two thirds R. And now imagine that a Hadamard gate is applied to your brain. Okay, or in other words, that this state is rotated unitarily to produce some other state. Uh, you know, and now uh, if we ask a question like, well, what is the probability that for you the dot changes color? You know, that, for, that you go from B to R or vice versa, right? From this perspective of standard quantum mechanics, that's just a nonsense question. Okay, it just, uh, you know, the, the Born rule gives no uh, clear answer to it. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, but, but if we were being manipulated in superposition, right, that's the type of thing that you might worry about. Okay, so, so you know, all, all of this, I think, was, you know, known for a while that, you know, if you're being manipulated in superposition, there's not even a clear uh, a reason why the arrow of time, you know, applies to you, why, you know, uh, time should be going forwards for you and not backwards, or why there should be trans-temporal identity, like why should we say that after the Hadamard gate is applied that, you know, you're even the same uh, 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 observer as you were before it was applied. Um, so, you know, the, the Frauchiger-Renner paper, uh, which I guess inspired or provoked this panel, you know, from my point of view, is just giving another example of the breakdown of the Born rule, and, you know, in fact, the, the breakdown even of trans-temporal identity, you know, when agents get to manipulate each other in superposition states. Uh, so, uh, you know, at, at a technical level, I agree with uh, Matt that uh, it's uh, sort of a, a mashup of... Uh, Previous paradoxes, you know, the Wigner's friend paradox, which you know, it, it, which uh, in and in the case of Frauchiger Renner, uh, Hardy's paradox. So basically, you imagine two observers who are not only in superpositions of different mental states, but those superpositions are also entangled with each other, and uh, and then you you have two more observers who measure the two superposed observers in uh, in bases that in require Hadamarding their brains, 
and then you know there's a certain outcome. Quantum mechanics says that it should occur with probability one over twelve. But then you know they engage in all this reasoning about observers' knowledge of each other that leads leads them to say that the probability should be zero, and that's the contradiction. Okay, and my view is just that the reasoning that leads to the outcome zero is fallacious. Uh, because a, the agents in a setup like theirs, uh, there's no reason to think that they even have stable identities over time as they would need to for Frauschiger and Renner's reasoning to work. And even if they did, then there's no reason to think that, they, that such superposed agents uh, would be able to apply the Born rule in the same way that we apply it. So, you know, in some sense, while their math is correct, uh, these are the reasons why I'm sort of not kept awake at night by this paradox, uh, or at least no more so than I'm kept awake by just the measurement problem of quantum mechanics itself, which has been with us for 90 years. The reason why we need these four players is precisely because we, we don't have this issue of the transtemporal identity. So we don't need, like, Alice at the beginning of the experiment to be the same agent as Alice at the end of the experiment. Uh, and in fact, when we apply all these chains of reasonings, it's just between agents at a very, very well-defined point in time. So we don't need them to, to keep their identities throughout. Uh, definitely not after being measured. Maybe one of the issues is that I should not be able to, I should not expect myself to be able to make a, a, a proper prediction now, if later on I know that, that my brain is going to be Hadamard. So in fact, there's even models for, for quantum computation, or we do more or less this. So, for example, if you use like Bennett's idea of reversible computation, so you run a whole quantum computation, you copy the output um, coherently to some other memory, and then you undo the whole circuit before, right? And this whole circuit could be like your, like your quantum memory. And you still expect this prediction that, that survived and that is now stored somewhere else to be accurate. Okay. And what happens uh, in this experiment is precisely this. So Alice runs through her little circuit, and she makes a a prediction, which is maybe not a perfect copy because it's, uh, it's like a partial witness of a prediction that she gives to Bob, and this survives the whole, um, uh, the, the whole measurement. So it kind of avoids this, uh, this problem. If we forget about the whole, it being about consciousness and it being about large agents and it being um, a bit um, unrealistic, and, and you think about a m much more concrete problem of like we have quantum computers, they might be in a quantum network, they might want to exchange quantum information between them and not just classical outputs, then what are the rules that we need to, to give them? What's the consistent set of rules we need to give them such that um, they don't reach this kind of contradictions, okay? And here's where I think that this thought experiment shows us that we don't have such a set of rules. This will be uh, relevant not just for foundations but also for, for quantum computation, I think. Okay, I'll stop here, and then I guess we'll argue later. Raphael. Thanks. Uh, so I, I so fully agree with everything that Scott said that uh, I'll try to say go in a different direction from what I was going to uh, comment. Um, in fact, it, 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 I have to make a confession, first of all. I'm not sure I totally belong with people who have thought deeply about quantum foundations. I recall a conference a few years ago where I emailed Scott um, asking him, what interpretation of quantum mechanics do I believe in? Uh, because all these philosophers around me want to know, and I, uh, <laughs> you know, give me something. Um, and, and, and he gave me something, and the conclusion was that I'm a user. That, that didn't sound very flattering. Uh, but but uh, here's my credo. I'm going to paraphrase uh, John F. Kennedy. Uh, I believe, uh, you know, don't ask what you can do for your theory, ask what your theory can do for you. Um, for example, don't go in there and, you know, impose some idea of what's real, what's fundamental, what's emergent uh, on your theory. Ask the theory to tell you what are the fundamental concepts in terms of which it's easy to formulate the laws of nature, what are complicated things that emerge from that. Uh, the theory could be wrong, so you should be testing it, but assuming that you've tested it for a while and you have some confidence in it, you should be going and asking your theory to tell you those things. Um, now, one thing that I've concluded from, quantum, uh, from, from thinking about quantum mechanics is that decoherence is a process that clearly happens as a physical process. We interact with an environment, we don't control it. Um, and to that extent, for example, I'm satisfied uh, that the cat, even before I open the door, 
isn't in fact in a state of superposition up and down. That's just not supported in the density operator that describes the cat. Um, and it's also clear, however, that this concept of decoherence is an approximate and emergent concept. I can reduce the number of degrees of freedom of the environment and of the cat until I maybe have just one particle bouncing off another particle. At that point, I can reverse the process if I wish. I can really do this practically in the lab, and people do do, do, do this in the lab. And so this interpolation between large and small systems shows us that something happening, like the cat died, is an emergent and approximate concept which becomes very reliable in the limit of large n, but which is ultimately not a fundamental thing. One thing I'd like to point out is that when the cat dies here today in this room, but you look at the galaxy as a whole, decoherence will not have happened for another 100,000 years, right? if, if you have access to all of the galaxy, because it takes that long for any system to even travel out of the galaxy. Uh, and to make that even sharper, let's suppose that a spider spun a web around the galaxy, which isolates the galaxy completely from the rest of the universe. Right? To that spider, the cat dying never happened. All those different choices in our lives always stay in superposition, um, and I don't see that as a contradiction. That's kind of my main statement. There is no logical contradiction between these two things, nor is there an experimental contradiction. In particular, in this setup, I cannot communicate with a spider. The spider can't ask me what happened without breaking the isolation of the system. Uh, so all of these things may seem weird, but I don't think we get to attack them because we find them weird, and I don't see any experimental or logical contradiction. Um, I, I think this FR a paradox is an example that's sort of analogous to the spider you know, manipulating large parts of gal galaxies and creating inconsistent mm -hmm. classical records, and I should not be surprised that I see what seems like contradictory conclusions from different agents when I get to do these kind of operations that operate on a large n number of bits in a coherent way. Let me resist the temptation to try to persuade Raphael that the interpretation he believes is the average interpretation. <laughs> let me ask okay a... With that. I don't care what it is. <laughs> let, me, let me ask a, a sort of super naive question just to, just to the panel, picking up on some of this. So I, this is not an area I'm super familiar with, but one of the, one of the themes that comes up at various points is that, you know, the, I, I can, there are various things I can do uh, that could be done to me, let's say, using advanced quantum technology that would mean the normal ways of treating me as an agent would stop working. But there are also much more straightforward things you could do that would do that. You could hit me on the head or you could inject me with sodium pentothal or something. So is, is there, and perhaps this is a particular question to Lydia, um, is, but anyone, anyone come in by all means, is, is, is there a good way of seeing what's distinctively different about the kind of interventions we have here as opposed to just like ordinary interventions that spoil the physical assumptions that maybe count as an agent? Well, I, mean, I mean, I feel like there's always some background assumption when we engage in reasoning that uh, 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 sort of, you know, our, our integrity as reasoning agents is somehow preserved. Like if, if uh, you know, you, you like I, I said, well, here's this, this mathematical proof and, you know, you, I've, I've shown you each step, you know, this is why it's sound. And then you said, well, well, what if I told you that a mad scientist just, you know, manipulated your brain so that you think it, you, you just thought it was sound and it wasn't? Well, then, you know, I guess I have nothing to say, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, there's, a there's... distinction, actually. Well, yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. There's, no, but, you know, there's, there's, there's some, there's some sort of cognitive yeah. stability um, needed. But all right, all right, yeah. Well, Lydia? Yeah. I think the situation is more analogous to, I make the proof now, I convince you of it, and then later on, the mad scientist comes and changes my mind. And this should have no, I mean, unless you believe in retro causality, then this should have no influence on whether you believe my proof or not, because you believe me to be rational back in the day. And yes, so to, to answer your question, I don't know of a, of a natural threshold for saying, oh, some interventions will, be, will, will, will mean that everything that happened before cannot be trusted because they have some quantum aspect to that, and some will not. And I don't know where this threshold would be, and this would be something that we'd be searching for. But Matt, maybe. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it is important to recognize that there are different versions of, the, of these arguments. And I personally think that the question of uh, the sort of integrity of an agent over time is a little bit beside the point. Um, all we need is there to be something that counts as an observer, right? So something that we can say has seen something definite and there to be a fact of the matter about what they've seen. That's all, that's all you need. Whether 
that person suddenly subsequently has their memory erased and cannot be thought of as the same agent anymore doesn't really matter to the argument so long as you can say there was still a fact of the matter about what they observed. Now, of course, things like Everett and Many Worlds would precisely deny that kind of thing, but you know, I already said I don't think it really applies to that, that kind of interpretation. Yeah, so I think a, a, a key difference between the two uh, options, let, so let me characterize them as follows. One is that I secretly inject you with a drug and change your memories, uh, and the other is that the spider outside the galaxy, uh, you know, briefly, through some incredibly detailed unitary operator, changes your memories in your brain and then pulls the plug out again and nothing else. So the, the, a key difference between those two things is that the first option created classical records in the galaxy uh, and the second did not. And so if I'm a, a careful uh, you know, uh, police uh, investigator, I, I, you know, they can catch me because you know, somebody filmed me doing this or, or I dropped a little bit of the, of the drug on the floor. They, 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 can, they can figure out that this happened and in the end there is a completely consistent classical history in our galaxy in that, in that story, whereas if the spider goes in and messes with your brain, we really have inconsistent classical records. Mm -hmm. uh, and and this, is, you know, this is something that does not happen from normal quantum evolution in the sense of like likely quantum evolution in the large end limit. Yeah, I think that this is probably the right point to open it up for questions from the audience. So I'm going to point to people and then a microphone is going to be rushed to you by my um, helpful minions, whoever they are. So over here. If you want to wait till the microphone gets to you before um, uh, starting to speak, though. I'm, I'm sort of intrigued by the possibility that the quantum computers could be the agents, okay? So if you have one uh, quantum computer having a different perspective to, from another, that could uh, involve actually um, dephasing for one of the computers, which is not happening for the other. So imagine that one of these uh, computers has an ancilla, which it cannot control, and it sort of, uh, because it treats it as something that it can't control, it sort of becomes dephased once things have been entangled with that ancilla. And then the other computer is a, from a more macroscop for more macroscopic system. It can still control it, and it controls the ancilla and sort of undoes this. Then the two computers really would have different perspectives, and they sh would use uh, quantum mechanics differently. Is that a good way to yeah, look at yes, it? Yes, yes, this is a good way to put it. Yes, yes. So in in the case of this experiment, you have two of this smaller computers that don't control the ancillas, and then you have two larger computers that come and can control the ancillas, right? And the question is, should you, should you just say that if you, have, if you ever reach such a physical situation, you cannot have uh, like a sensible set of rules for what kind of conclusions this, this, this network of computers can reach or not? And I think ideally we, we would want to have such a thing. So uh, I would say that in order to use the quantum, the Copenhagen interpretation, your measurement, uh, the solution to the problem that you're posing is that the measurement really has to be irreversible. The result has to be uh, irreversibly recorded in the universe. So this could be uh, even uh, not applied to a classical system. If you have a classical system that does some measurement and then someone clever comes up and undoes all the operations, then According to this uh, uh, version of the Copenhagen interpretation, even that measurement never happened. And then it depends on your perspective. Okay. Sure, sure. So, that, so then the question is, of course, if you have a, a theory, we have very good theories that work in this regime where there is now a classical, a classical register that it can be shared by many agents or this environment where everyone decoheres to. And the, the question is just like, now if I want to extend the physical theory and, the, and this... Uh, logic and reasoning to a scenario where I don't have this property, can I still do it or not? And of course, for many practical cases, it, it doesn't matter, right? But you could think that it would be nice to think about what happens now if you have, if you have quantum computers that not just at the end uh, print a classical output that you can use, but if you keep all this, of, all this information uh, quantum, then how far can you go in processing it? But I think Scott wanted to add yes. Yeah, so I mean, I just wanted to say that, you know, I think that the point that Raphael made about, you know, 
uh, 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 classical records sort of being necessary for sort of, let's say, observers as we know them, observers as we have ever experienced them, is really central to this, to this discussion. You don't have to use the term transtemporal identity if you don't want to, right? But I think that is precisely the point at issue, right? That in order for the Frauschiger Renner paradox to even get off the ground, you need observers that are maintained in coherent superposition states where these records will not be created. We have never, uh, you know, observed any observer of that kind. And, uh, you know, what, what would such an observer be like? Well, I mean, that's a profound question from one point of view, but, you know, you, you might expect that a lot of the reasoning that, you know, you would normally apply would not go through for such an observer. Okay, next question. Uh, so, uh, Paul Davies, um, could the panel please comment on the recent experiment of catching a quantum jump in mid-flight and reversing it before it had made up its mind? Are you familiar with the yeah. experiment? So, so, some, someone said that you know the, 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 we need we need to start a Twitter account. You know, have you seen the t like Twitter account that just retweets like medical studies and it just adds the word in mice? Just you know, you know, like researchers cure Alzheimer's, blah blah blah, in mice, and it just does this hundreds of times in mice, in mice, in mice. We need you know, and so so I think Sean, it was Sean Carroll who said we need a Twitter account that says as predicted by the Schrodinger equation. You know, researchers do such and such experiment, observe quantum jump in mid-flight, as predicted by the Schrodinger equation, as predicted by the Schrodinger equation, as predicted by the Schrodinger equation. You know, and, and, and I think that, oh, you know, the, the like 90% like of the popular quantum mechanics journalism of the last 20 years, you know, you know that would apply to. Skeptical. Oh, yeah. No, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, yeah, I mean, 100% uh, uh, of the uh, journalism about experiments. Hi, so I have a question that goes back to what Scott said. Um, so you know, when somebody comes up with some weird quantum phenomenon, then it's often a good um, strategy to step back and ask, can I have the same thing classically? Yeah, somebody says, oh, you know, the photon over here, if it's that, you know, or if the spin is up for Alice, Alice knows immediately spin must be down for Bob. Oh, that's so exciting. Well, not really, because I can have the same with a box of shoes, classically, and you have to work harder to see that there's really something new about quantum theory. You have to come up with a balance inequality violation. Now, as Scott said, like, um, as soon as you erase memory of these processes where you erase memory, it's perhaps not so surprising that the way that the theory is used um, there is not, uh, doesn't work in a consistent way as you would expect it. Now, I would just wonder if anybody in the panel had ever um, thought about these Wigner's friend experiments in the classical context. For example, there are these classical thought experiments like um, Sleeping Beauty and so on, where something like that actually happens. You have memory erasure and you have problems to assign probabilities in a consistent way. So perhaps both are just two sides of the same coin. It's just that there's a quantum, perhaps the quantum version is a bit more extreme than what you could have classically, but perhaps you can have the same phenomenon classically. So is that something somebody if you have thought about? Matt, you want to? Yeah, I mean, this is, so the simple answer to that question is that's precisely why you need the Frauschiger Arena rather than just a, a pure Wigner's friend experiment, because in the Frauschiger Arena experiment, you get bell correlations. And it's that, that, that part of it that, that rules out some simple kind of uh, classical analog of this. If you have a view of quantum mechanics of the kind of many world, etc., this uh, 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 Gedanke experiment don't have much teeth because they, they talk about things which are um, uh, which are not foundational in your view of quantum mechanics. Because you, <clears throat> to go to facts of the matter, you have to go the way Raphael is saying. You have to think about the coherence, classical world, blah blah, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if you instead want to think about quantum mechanics. Uh, um, as talking about fact of the matters about the world, as they are in particular known by a subject, which is a physical system, then they have teeth. And uh, uh, I, I, I fully agree with that. And they have teeth and they force us, in that case, to go to a fully perspectival um, uh, understanding of that's in this direction, this is what mechanics telling us. And you seem to say, uh, which is horrible. <laughs> um, I uh, want to uh, 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 comment that, and, and this is the core of relational quantum mechanics, that this 
perspectival uh, conclusion. I mean, different observers have different accounts of the same set of events. Um, it's uh, what quantum mechanics says if you take this perspective, um, but also that is not so dramatic because it's minimal in the sense that uh, uh, different uh, observers agrees, uh, can communicate quantum mechanically among themselves and agree largely about a common world up to little, little, little things that you need very sophisticated quantum mechanics experimented to bring about. So this is a point about uh, um, uh, relational quantum mechanics. And uh, you get a contradiction only if among your postulate, as Renner put it very clearly, you assume that there should be a consistency so there should be no perspectivalism. I'm not sure I said it was horrible. Um, <laughs> I, I don't disagree with you about that. Um, what, I, what I think it though is that, uh, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that most physicists who say they subscribe to the Copenhagen type of interpretation don't realize how, how extreme they're being. Right? They, uh, and uh, if there was more realization of that, then there might be more interest in, in getting the interpretation of quantum theory right amongst the general physics community. So uh, do you think there are two difficult problems that we are addressing? One is the problem of quantum gravity that we don't quite know how to solve, and the other one you mentioned, the, the measurement problem. Uh, do you think they're related? Uh, do you think that solving one may help you to solve the other in any order? That's to the panel. And to Raphael, I want to ask him if uh, the measure problem in cosmology may or may not be somehow related to the measurement problem in quantum mechanics. I'm sure you have some ideas about that, but I want to see if they changed over time. Okay, I'll take those in reverse order, I think. Raphael, do you want to respond to the second half? Um, yeah. Uh, so, well, I, I guess I'll say that I've, I've made one attempt to link those two things, um, which is very speculative, um, but many people here won't know what the measure problem is, but it basically has to do with the fact that if the universe becomes arbitrarily large, then by thinking about it globally, everything happens in it uh, with, with some non-zero probability and therefore infinitely many times if it just keeps on going. Uh, so you have, a trouble, you have some trouble defining what probabilities you should assign for things that you observe in the universe, and in particular how to recover ordinary probabilities in the lab. Um, one proposal that that um, I made for uh, approaching this problem is to restrict to um, what one observer can see in principle. So, so we can't see the universe globally because of, of cosmological event horizons and so on. And uh, so you could instead consider a, dis a probabilistic distribution over things that could have evolved in one observer's causal past. Where observer doesn't mean a real observer, but just some world line. Um, this is a somewhat useful viewpoint, it turned out. So, this measure had some advantages from the viewpoint of agreeing with, with observation in, in some respects, but it also had some conceptual advantage uh, of, of being somewhat economical, but also of giving you one potential approach uh, to getting around this problem that I, or I, don't, I don't see as a problem, but a fact about quantum mechanics, which is that things happening is an approximate concept. They can unhappen and so on. Um, but if you, uh, if you consider the fact that, that your own uh, causal past has an ultimate boundary no matter how long you live, then there is in fact an environment from which things can, can never come back. And so any degrees of freedom that are lost across the cosmological horizon would, would give rise to, uh, to decoherence which is in some sense irreversible. There's still some quantum gravity effects to worry about in this case, so Lenny and I consider it a more extreme situation where you have a, a, a region with, with zero cosmological constant to exclude those. But the basic idea there is that, that to the extent that you have degrees of freedom leaving uh, the cosmological horizon, uh, they really define uh, a sort of sharp classical branching tree of possibilities that, that won't be undone. Any of the panel want to comment on the first part of the question, or, or indeed on that? Yeah. Yeah, so so I'm, I'm actually a big fan of what's been called the busso suskin cosmological interpretation of quantum mechanics, possibly even more so than Busso or Susskind themselves are. But, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I mean, so this is a view that, uh, uh, you know, I'm not sure if it, if it links uh, uh, the measurement problem to quantum gravity per se, but certainly to the type of cosmology that we live in. And the, the, the and like, for example, the fact 
fact that we don't live in anti-dissenter space, right? In in ADS, uh, you know, any uh, uh, signal that uh, uh, went toward our hor horizon after a finite time would bounce back, and you know, we could have a recoherence, and so you wouldn't have this definite criterion for like a, a branching to have happened or for a record to have been created. So in that sense, you know, you could say that a lot of the recent work on quantum gravity, because it's depended on ADS CFT, right, it's actually gone in sort of the, the opposite direction from this, you know, this point of view, right, and, and the challenge is to get uh, quantum theories of gravity that apply to a world where the busso suskind interpretation would work. Um, yeah, so since you were focusing mostly on the frauhe renner experiment, I was just wondering whether you guys in the panel had thought much about um, this other thought experiment. I know that, that Matt is familiar with it, that I presented in one of the lightning talks, which is essentially was essentially a, a, a formal proof of a theorem that was proposed by Bruckner last year with this extended weakness friend scenario, which has simpler or different kind of assumptions. So I would like to know what what is, whether you have thought about those and what are your opinions about that and how you think it relates to Frau and Rainer, whether you add something new. Uh, yeah, Matt. Um, yeah, so one of the things that I disliked about the way that Chaslav did things was having a locality assumption. Um, now the sort of, once you're outside the framework of realist interpretations and you're being more Copenhagen-ish, there's there's not really anything wrong with a locality assumption there because, of course, Bell's theorem only applies to these more realist theories. But nonetheless, since uh, the idea of non-local theories is on the table already and something that people think that uh, we might need, I personally don't like making, having to make a locality assumption in those theories. Uh, and what I like more about the sort of pussy version that I was uh, alluding to earlier is that um, you know the constraint of local causality that you need to derive the conclusion comes from assumptions that have nothing to well at least seemingly have nothing to do with locality. So that's kind of the reason why I prefer that version. Um, but you know, nonetheless, uh, the advantage of it is that it turns some in, you know the Pussy version can never be experimentally tested because. It relies on the existence. It, rely, it, it makes essential use of correlations, which, by definition, cannot be experimentally uh, verified. The advantage of the Bruckner version and the version that in your paper is that it converts it into an experiment, which could, in principle, be tested. I mean, of course, you need to have these macro superpositions of agents and things like that. But in principle, you could uh, get a result and test an inequality. Um, but at the expense of assuming locality, which, uh, given what we know about quantum foundations, I'm not uh, too keen on doing. Okay, we're out of questions and virtually out of time. I'm going to invite any of the panel who want to take literally 30 seconds to have a closing remark to go ahead. Most of these experiments have no consequence in a world where there are classical records or in, in the... Yeah, in all practical scenarios, but... So the question is, but aren't you still curious to see what happens in the other regime? I mean, the whole effort of quantum computation is to create these large, these large systems that can keep coherence, right? And aren't you curious to see like, what you could do if you have a network of such systems? And I think what will happen is as predicted by the Schrodinger equation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 extremely curious, you know, and, uh, uh, to see uh, if you know large scalable quantum computers can work. Uh, uh, you know, or, or I don't know if curious or eager is is the is the better word. Uh, but you know, my my guess would be that they eventually will work, just because that is the boring conservative possibility the one that does not require a revolution in physics. And assuming that they can work, then I think it is absolutely crystal clear that the result of the frauschiger renner experiment, if you do it, is, yeah, you see the impossible outcome with probability 1 over 12. <laughs> you know, exactly as predicted by the Schrodinger equation. That's the answer. That is the answer. We know that before doing the experiment. Okay, That's okay. the answer. Okay, Matt, do you want to have the last word? Uh, one of the great disappointments of working on quantum foundations is that 
uh, all the experiments that you ever do confirm quantum mechanics. <laughs> it's like, that's the problem with it. Yeah. Okay, I think on that note, we'll wrap up. Could I ask everyone to thank the panel?